Welcome back to Sharp's Cannon. I'm your host, Captain Rutledge. At last, we take a look at Sharp's first foray in the Peninsular War, Sharp's Rifles. First published in 1988, Sharp's Rifles served as a prequel novel to the main Sharp series set in Spain. The TV movie first aired on ITV in 1993, then on Masterpiece on PBS in 1993 as well, served as the pilot movie for the series to come, starring Sean Bean as Richard Sharp, Dara O'Malley as Patrick Harper, Assumpta Serna as Teresa Moreno, and Brian Cox as Michael Hogan, with David Trufton as Sir Arthur Wellesley. A few early scenes were originally filmed with Paul McGann as Sharp and Diana Peñalver as Teresa, albeit after the infamous football injury this became difficult, and new scenes were filmed with Sean Bean and Assumpta Serna in the lead roles, on location in both Crimea and Portugal. To better understand the world of Sharp in the Peninsular War, we should cover a few bases with history. 1807. Portugal is in defiance of Napoleon's continental system blockading British trade. The Emperor marched his troops across Spain to occupy Portugal, forcing the royal family to seek refuge in Brazil. Although France and Spain were allies, Napoleon's continued occupation of the peninsula drove a wedge between the two nations. Uprisings in 1808 caused Napoleon to overthrow King Ferdinand VII and install his brother Joseph as king. A British force commanded by Lieutenant General Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Lisbon that autumn and defeated the French at the battles of Rolisa and Vimeiro. Then, Wellesley was sent back to England. General Sir John Moore led the Anglo-Portuguese forces into Spain, but Napoleon caught wind of the advance and beat the British back to Coruña. The British rearguard fought hard through the winter until the army could evacuate, although General Moore was killed by a cannonball to the shoulder. Come spring 1809, General Wellesley returned to Portugal with fresh forces and defeated the French once more at the Second Battle of Porto. This is where we pick up with the TV episode, although the novel began earlier, during the retreat from Coruña. Both storylines share similar plot beats, yet the overarching storylines couldn't be more different. The novel is merely a story of survival. Sharp and his riflemen are cut off by the French, trying to make their way to friendly grounds. Major Warren Dunnett is captured by the French, Captain John Murray is dead. It's up to Lieutenant Richard Sharp, the detachment's quartermaster, armed with Captain Murray's heavy sword, to lead the 30 remaining riflemen to safety, no matter how much they despise him. The TV episode gives Sharp a mission to perform. He had recently been promoted from the ranks for rescuing General Wellesley from French cavalry, and to avoid the dull fate of quartermaster duties, took a job from Wellesley and Major Hogan to command a platoon of chosen men in a mission to find James Rothschild and the British Army bank draft. One great moment is the scene where they introduce themselves to Sharp, thus revealing the series A team going forwards. Full kit in five minutes! The chosen men, eh? Well, I didn't choose you. Name, rank. Patrick Michael Harper, chosen man, sir. Top of the morning, Harper. Name, Cooper. Where are you from, Cooper? Shoreditch, sir. Previous employment? By way of a trader, sir. Daniel Eggman, County of Cheshire. Horsey. Harris, from Wheatley in Oxfordshire. A courtier to my Lord Bacchus and an unremitting debtor. Is there anything you can do? I can read, sir. I saw a tongue, sir. Yes, I know that. Where are you from, Tongue? Don't know, sir. Previous employment. Army, sir. Just army. Young Perkins, sir. Major Dunnett told me to find him. On the way, the detachment of rifles is attacked by French cavalry, while Sharp and the chosen men look on helplessly. Again, Sharp needs to lead the remaining chosen men back to Portugal and safety. Don't be too hard on the men, Sharp. They think of you as one of them, Sharp. One of the damned. Get Patrick Harper on your side. Is that an order, sir? I want you to have my sword. Maybe if the men see you carry it. They'll think I'm a proper officer. 
No, they'll think I liked you. Aiding the riflemen in their retreat are Spanish guerrillas, partisans roaming the hills and wreaking havoc on the French. The leader of those partisans, Major Don Blas Vivar. Vivar, in both adaptations, arrives as sharp as in fisticuffs with the burly Irish rifleman Patrick Harper. As both his partisans and Sharp's platoon are headed in the same direction, they join forces for mutual safety. Vivar is a devout Catholic, honest, and honorable, and was once a nobleman overthrown by the French and his Francophile brother, the current Count of Moromorto, or uh, Matamoros in the TV episode. The French cavalry chasing after the group are accompanied by the Count, seeking out Vivar and his partisans. In the TV series, we meet another Spanish partisan uh, allied with Vivar, Comandante Teresa Moreno. Teresa did not appear in the novel series until the events of Sharp's Gold, the film of which we will see later on. Originally, Sharp helped to save her from an assault at the hands of two French soldiers. She is, here, another Spanish partisan fighting the French, allied with a stiletto blade and doing some pretty nasty work on her enemies. The Spanish call her the needle. Don't ask why. She is mostly included in the TV episode to give Sharp a love interest, but proves her necessity to the plot by her cunning fighting skills and willingness to show Sharp the ways of a proper officer. You listen to soldiers gossip, Mom. Yes, I do. You see, we have two ears, but only one mouth. So a good leader will listen twice as much as he shouts. One of those ways she assists Sharp is by encouraging him to listen to those under his command, the Chosen Men, especially Patrick Harper. Harper's choice in life was to either starve to death in Ireland or join the British Army, the very army that made life difficult for his people back home. He is strong and imposing, with most of the men pledging loyalty to him rather than their NCOs. After his mutinous brawl with Sharp, he is dragged behind the army as a prisoner for court-martial, but he soon finds equal ground with Sharp based on their situations. I thought wild things like the freedom. Freedom to starve is no freedom, sir. Is that why you joined the British Army, Harper? Maybe. Can't be easy to be Irish. Wear the uniform of England. No harder than it is for yourself, sir, having to walk into the officer's mess wearing the uniform of a gentleman. <laughs> you fight dirty, Harper. Harper eventually proves his loyalty by turning down a bribe from the Count and killing his French escort, effectively wiping away his previous charges. Fall in, Rifleman Harper. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Do you not wish your officer to give you some high honors? That's what he did. He taught me to fall in. Along the way, Sharp and Vivar come across a family of Methodist missionaries. Mr. and Mrs. Parker, and their daughter, Louisa. The Parkers had a larger role in the original novel. Mrs. Parker continuously lambasted Sharp for his use of profanity and alcohol, while Louisa became fascinated by both him and Major Vivar. Thus forms a sort of love triangle, although Vivar wins out in the end in the novel. We can see some of Louisa's implied fascination with Vivar in the TV episode, but, alas, none of Sharp's awkward flirtations with her and nothing from Mrs. Parker. Which is honestly a shame. One great scene in the novel involves Sharp finding half his men dead drunk one morning, burning them mercilessly and pushing them into an icy river to work out the liquor in their systems. As the Parkers arrived, all the drunk men were standing freezing and naked, much to the shock of Mrs. Parker. Why don't we hear much from Mrs. Parker in the TV episode? I'll explain later. After the uh, drunk incident, the novel continues with Sharp and his men ambushed by the French, accompanied by the Count, saved in the nick of time by Vivar's partisans, though not before Sharp's sergeant is killed. The only suitable replacement? Harper, who refuses the promotion, at first. Vivar soon talks him into taking on the stripes for the sake of Sharp and the remaining riflemen. The TV series just has Sharp give Harper the stripes out of the blue one evening. Get a needle and thread. I need a sergeant by dawn. I'll never make a proper sergeant, sir. So? I'll never make a proper officer. On their way through the Galician hills, Major Vivar's men carry a strong box, supposedly carrying important documents. One evening, the secret of the box is revealed to Sharp. A thousand years ago, 
the Muslims swept across Spain on their way to Rome. My ancestors made a stand in these mountains. At sunset, my ancestor dying called on Santiago. St. James, the saint of Spain, Santiago came. He came with a banner of blood and a bright sword and slew the invaders in their thousands. And we dipped his banner in the blood and cried out, Santiago, child of thunder, child of battle. The gunflow kept in my family for a thousand years, lest we needed Santiago to keep his promise. What promise, Major? His promise that he would come again if Spain were invaded. Vivar is not taking Sharp back to safety in Portugal, but rather to the church of Santiago de Compostela, switched to the much less expensive Torre Castro in the TV episode. Once the bloodstained banner is waved from the church walls, the demoralized Spanish will rise up against their French captors. Rise up! For a rag and a pole! Sharp is hesitant to assist, but has no other choice with the French breathing down his neck. It's around this time in the TV movie that Major Hogan makes his appearance as the British liaison, seeking out Rothschild and allowing Major Vivar to perform his mission with the Gonfalon. This is a decent departure from the novel, as Captain Hogan doesn't appear until the final pages, taking Sharp and his riflemen on as protection during his scouting missions. In the novel, Sharp and Vivar's combined forces manage to hold off the French long enough in Santiago to perform the unfurling of the Gonfalon and engage with the Count's forces in combat while trying to escape. Vivar duels his brother and kills him while Sharp engages the French colonel, taking the colonel's boots and overalls as a prize. The TV episode features a climactic offensive during the taking of Torre Castro, culminating in the waving of the Gonfalon from the church after which Sharp and Viva respectively duel the Colonel and Count, killing both, though the Colonel is killed by a lucky shot from one of Sharp's riflemen. Give him yours, Harper. Take it, Tip Perkins. Give it back. In the end of the novel, Sharp and his men make it across the Portuguese border and are snatched up by Captain Hogan as his escorts. TV episodes see Sharp returning to Lisbon, revealing that Mrs. Parker was Rothschild all along. <laughs> How did you know? You smelt of Turkish tobacco. The kind you can't get in Spain. You didn't touch your pork at the monastery. And remember speaking Yiddish in the coach. Sir, you are an edel mensch. A gentleman. Your banker's draft, Sir Arthur. Sharp and Teresa engage in a little bit of hanky-panky, and everything wraps up nice and neat. Stick with me, Richard. I'll see you right. You'll see me dead, sir. That's my boy. <laughs> the answer remains, which work tells the better story? Rifles the novel or Rifles the movie? The novel ties fairly neatly into historical events following the retreat from La Coruña, as Bernard Cornwell writes in the ending historical note. The characters are revealed to the reader progressively, and we soon see who to root for and who to despise. The action tends to wax and wane in spots with several lighter moments meant to build on character, but often they can be tedious as the reader waits for the upcoming action scenes. The TV episode departs a good deal from the novel background-wise, choosing to show how the characters got to their present state, increasing roles for some going ahead, introducing future roles, and cutting back on less necessary characters. This could be budgetary, since six riflemen are easier to work with than three dozen extras, especially when that is about all the extras this production could wrangle up. For what it's worth, it's not terrible, but does what it can with what it has. And for that, does a decent enough job. Yay. I say yay. Yay. Both works do their utmost with what they have, but given the choice, I must side with the novel this time. It works better historically, Sharp's backstory is more organically woven in, and it is a fitting prequel to the following novels. Still, what do you folks think? Please comment below, and stay tuned for our next episode, because Sharp and Harper will march again. Good day. Good day.